You ready? Yeah. You ready? All right, hold on. Here we go. What's going on, everyone? It's the My Aggie Nation podcast. We're back. It's game week. It's game week. A&M takes on Kent State to kick off Jimbo Fisher's fourth season today. I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle. Over there, Alex Miller of the Eagle as well. What's going on, Alex? Hey, Travis. Doing pretty well. And our intrepid other co-host at WTAW, Zach Taylor. What's going on, guys? I like that new headset, Alex. It looks like you're about to uh, rock some newbies at Call of Duty or something. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Hey, I'll have you know, I played Fortnite a couple nights ago for the first time in like two years, and I had two kills and placed eighth. So I didn't, I didn't know fork knife was still a thing. It definitely is. Um, you know, didn't take home that victory royale, but hey, I did better than I thought I would. So there you go. You, you, your kids starting playing Fortnite yet, Zach? Uh, no, not yet. I, I okay. graduate up to that next week. This week is uh, Mario Kart. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Uh, well, we have some football to break down, I guess. First, before we get into Kent State and A&M's first battle of the season, the Board of Regents, the Texas A&M University System Board of Regents just voted unanimously to extend the contract of one John James Fisher, uh, the terms of which were sent out here by Texas A&M. It'll be a raise to nine million dollars starting uh, on January 1, 2022, will increase to 9.15 million January 1, 2023, and then will increase $100,000 each year uh, following that. Uh, and it's a four-year extension onto the already 10-year $7.5 million that he got when he first came to AM three years ago. So, gentlemen, what 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 is this? Why extend Jimbo right now? Is this a good move? Is this a bad move? What's your take, Zach? Um, well, I mean, it was coming out to that kind of year. They also had to approve a lot of his assistance last week. And so it wasn't like they just pulled this out of left field and were saying, hey, this is something we got to get done. Or there might have been some other uh some other callers out there for Jimbo Fisher services, even though I'm sure that there there have been and there will be um even after this contract is signed. But Hey, if you got the money and you got the time, then go for it. And if you're if you're AM, if you've got you know, the money. Money, honey, I got time. The time. Okay, yeah. we'll go sign in Jimbo to a big old fat contract. And that's what they did. <laughs> that's what they did. And I mean, like I said, you got the money, um, and you can flaunt it and you can say, look, this is gonna be our coach for the next. However many years, I know the extension uh, added four more years onto it. So he signed up through 2031. Um, I don't know if it's going to be, I'm assuming it's the same kind of deals that they had before and that it's guaranteed. So it's not like Jimbo has to give any money back if he were to go, uh, I don't know, if something were to happen or if he were to get uh, get get fired or whatever. Um, but hey, if you got the money, and it's only going to go up from here, folks. I, I don't know why people are are sitting there wringing their hands thinking, oh my gosh, $9 million for Jimbo Fisher. It's it's only going to go up. And I get that the proof is not necessarily there. He is not Nick Saban. He has not won a national championship at his current school. But AM has that kind of cash, and they want Jimbo Fisher to be an Aggie for a long time. So, um, yeah, backed up the Brinks truck, what have you, and he's getting paid. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's the wrong move, but it may seem a little premature. I mean, here's the deal. He was hired in 2017 to come win a championship. He was given the huge, fully guaranteed contract that everybody talks about and has been talking about ever since he's been hired. AM won an Orange Bowl last year, which was very successful as far as AM standards go. But is that a championship? No. So it, it, that's why I think it may be just a little premature had A&M won at least the division this season. And then, okay, maybe the first or second week of January, we're seeing Jimbo getting this kind of deal. That makes total sense to me because he had actually, he would have actually had delivered. Now the stakes are raised even higher. I feel like uh, Travis, we were talking about this earlier, but you know, if, if you don't go and win this championship or a championship, I mean, one, the initial contract seems to have been kind of a flop, but now even 
anteing it up and extending it even further seems like maybe even a bigger one. But it, like like Zach said, a ms on the right trajectory. It seems as if that's going to happen as soon as potentially this year. Um, it, it, it did seem just a little premature, in my opinion, though, to, to give him this kind of extension. I know each year one team wins a national championship and one team wins an SEC championship. And a lot of times that has been Alabama, which is in the exact same division as A&M. So yes, you can say a ton of times Jimbo Fisher was hired to beat Alabama, to win conference championships, to win national championships. But with the state of how college football is right now, if you have a coach that you've seen consistent improvement with and who by all accounts and, and, and by all, uh, you know, prospects seem like he's going to be a coach that will have a and M right there in the conversation on the pre- precipice of the playoff every year in all reality in today's college football is, is that kind of all you can ask for? I mean, is that the reaction to this? Because you can definitely get a lot worse. I mean, look at programs like Tennessee, look at programs like Nebraska um, who, who are blue chips, blue, look at Michigan, teams that are blue chip blue bloods who uh, just kind of haven't been able to find that right coaching fit. a has their coaching fit. They're, they're in the conversation. They're going to, they're, they're on national TV games. They're in the sec. I, I, I think that in today's college football, it might be a little bit less about the conference when it title wins and the national championship wins as much as uh, relevancy and, and being in the conversation every time. Right. And oh. that's what that's why I think you can justify making this move right now, because the sustainability of AM is probably pretty high. It, the way recruiting is going, AM is going to have top tier talent for at least the next three to four years. Um, you know, I, I'm curious to see how the whole scheduling thing shakes out with Texas and OU joining the SEC. We don't even know, you know, they say they're not joining till 2025. We'll see what happens there. Uh, you know, does does Alabama come off AM schedule every year if they go to some sort of maybe pod system? How does that change how the schedule is and Alabama being a constant hurdle that AM has to get over to make the SEC championship game every single season? So yeah, I, I think the sustainability, like you said, Travis, is is why you can justify a move right now, even if you don't have a championship to hang on the shelf yet. Well, and as far as building the brand, too, I think that kind of goes along with what you guys are saying. And the fact that Jimbo Fisher has put Texas A&M in those conversations, talking about the national championship. And I mean, we would be remiss if we would say that, hey, you know, the the powers that be at A&M don't really know how to act whenever they're kind of the top dog on the street. You know what I mean? I mean, they hadn't really been in this position before. And you know, tra- or I should say Alex made mention that it might have been a little premature. I I would Totally agree with that. They also signed Kevin Sumlin to a big extension after year one with Johnny Manziel, and that came back to bite them. Obviously, this is quite a bit more money. You do have a more proven coach, however, who has done it at a previous school. Um, At this point, though, it's almost monopoly money. It really is. Like For A&M, schools like Texas A&M and Michigan and Texas and Alabama, it's kind of more or less, hey, name your price, we'll match it, whatever. We'll throw as much money at you as we can because we got more money than we know what to do with. And that's basically what it's boiled down to. Uh, They don't have to wait for results. They want to go ahead and pay the coach that they think is going to bring them back to prominence or or to prominence for the first time since 1939, uh, looking for a national championship, not saying being in the, in the, uh, the conversation, A&M has done that plenty of time, but as far as getting a title for the first time since 1939, they think they've got the guy in Jimbo Fisher and, They've got the money. So as I said, you got it. Might as well spend it. Zach, I have to stop this down real quick and ask, we, you know, for those of you listening on the podcast, we have a Zoom going here and I have to kind of look on the desk. Is, is that a pair of whitey tidies on the desk behind you? What? Where? Right on this paper? That's a mask. No, no. Oh, it's a mask. Oh, okay. This is my, this is my. Oh, okay. My office. Uh, <laughs> the office spread these out. Uh, once the pandemic hit initially, uh, the office. So this is my uh, official Brian broadcasting uh, diaper slash mask that I can I can wear if I so choose. However, I do not, uh, and I still haven't thrown it away. 
So I, I didn't know if that was just like some some touchdown celebration underwear or something uh, like that. Or no, 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 no. Okay. Well, anyway, That's let's wrong. go back to this Jimbo Fisher conversation. Alex Miller uh, brought up a good point a little bit ago too. How much of this do you think is reactionary to the fact that? LSU came off a not so great season last year at Ogeron kind of either is winning a national championship or somewhat kind of on the hot seat. It, could this be preemptive and that the LSU seemingly might be about the only place that you could imagine Jimbo Fisher landing other than A&M? Yeah, you know, when you look at the landscape of things, you get, if a and ms anting itself up to maybe jockey itself to be in good position versus what other schools could be bidding if, if they need a new coach. Um, LSU is definitely one of the schools that, you know, it, another bad season or two, or, you know, if NCAA allegations or other things come down on the Tigers program, you know, LSU could quickly be looking for a coach, um, you know, all the euphoria of 2019 has kind of dissipated when, when you think about all the guys that left immediately uh, a pretty bad season last year, you know, a lot of people are pretty optimistic about LSU coming into this year, but I'm not too, I'm not too certain if I'm buying the hype that others are uh, putting out there, but you know, the, the big reason Jimbo came to A&M was a lot to do with Scott Woodward and who's the athletic director at LSU now. Scott Woodward, um, you know, LSU, LSU, that, that is, that is very much, uh, the team in Louisiana, as we all know. And, you know, that they flirted with Jimbo, uh, before they hired Edo before Les Miles even, you know, was fired when he was maybe going to be fired the first time and saved his job by beating a and Kyle field. So, so yeah. Um, the, the thing though, is when you look at it, in a situation where there would be that kind of deal of Jimbo maybe picking between A&M and LSU, you got to look at what the circumstances would be. LSU would either be down kind of not very good, having consecutive years of not, not great seasons under Edo, or maybe if allegations come out and, and they're on probation, you know, that that's kind of a that's kind of two big holes to get out of. Whereas you're at AM, you have the the backing, the resources. Uh, it seems as if facility upgrades are in the horizon. Uh, you know, why would you why would you leave that kind of situation to go to a place where you're gonna have to potentially start from scratch and maybe face some reprimands of things that you weren't even responsible for? So that's why I, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure if this is a this is a preemptive measure to maybe outbid an LSU or or what others might say. But you know if if that is the case, you know you, you got to look at it how it is. Uh, I'm right along with Alex. If you if you put your blinders on and say, look, we are not going to look at what has transpired over history, right? We will not look at the history of each program because LSU obviously has a very storied history. But if you're looking at where the programs are right now and, and where these teams are stacking up, the trajectory of these schools, obviously some of the things that are going around it, like those NCAA investigations that are currently going on for the Tigers, which would you say is the better job? I mean, if you're taking history away from it right now, if you're a coach and you have your choice between LSU and Texas A&M, they're going to pay you about the same. Ed Ogeron, by the way, was making more than Jimbo Fisher was last year. Ed O uh, was making, was looking here. Actually, he was the second highest paid coach in the nation at over eight and a half million dollars last year. So LSU obviously is able to pony things up. Uh, for their football program. I don't know if you could say the same thing about, about everything else. I think the athletics program has plenty of money, but that being said, if you look at it right now today, not taking, you know, take away the fact that LSU has got this history where the programs are at right now. I don't know if you say LSU is a better job uh, no, because, because you do have that stuff that's circling around it. I mean, what does LSU right now have that A&M doesn't aside from that, that history? You know, a lot of times when you talk to high school football coaches, they talk about wanting to coach in the one high school town. 
LSU is the one college in, in, in the state, the one college that matters. And that's the only thing that I can, and I'm not using this as an argument of why he would go. I'm just raising a point. That's the only, that's the only argument that you have at LSU is that in that state, everybody is an LSU fan where there's multiple colleges here. That being said, I don't see Jimbo Fisher bouncing over there. I think that, I think that that is um, something to think about, but I don't think that's necessarily why um, this all took place and, and why they, they went ahead and gave him the extension. So let's move on because there is actual real live football happening this weekend at Kyle field. They welcome Kent state under the lights for a home opener. What are, what are y'all the most excited about seeing for this, this game uh, from, I mean, either an Aggie or a Kent state perspective, but I'm thinking it's going to be an A&M perspective. Go ahead, Alex. I'll let you go first. I think the obvious is how, how, how are things going to look at quarterback? Um, you know, that's the biggest question mark. What, what's, what's it going to be like? Uh, Haynes King won the job. You know, it seemed as if it was a pretty stiff battle all through camp. Um, but, you know, what does he bring to the table? How does he fill in the shoes of Kellen Mond and what he left? You know, a, much of AM success last year came from how Kellen was able to command and dictate that offense well and at a high level. You know, where, where can Haynes pick up where Kellen left off? You know, how does he gel with a lot of these guys that are coming back? He's got weapons all over the place. Um, and, you know, if a and gets a big, you know, does Zach Calzada get in and get some quality reps? And what does he look like? You know, uh, knowing Jimbo and his history, Haynes is the guy and is probably going to be the guy unless something terrible happens. Um, but, you know, this is a game where you could potentially have your backup get significant amount of snaps uh, in, in a season where you you had you had a quarterback battle. And as they say, the backup is always one play away from being the starter. And it seems as if A&M's got two good options at quarterback, but you know, Haynes being the starter, what does he bring to the table? And what does he actually look like now that he's the starting quarterback for the Aggies? To that point, before we get to Zach's, this should be a game if everything goes as planned that we'll get to see both quarterbacks because you would think Haynes will see a good majority of the game, but then you'll probably see Zach, see Zach come in and when, when they kind of pull the second stringers on and it will be an interesting compare. While well, you can't necessarily compare it apples to apples because they probably will be going against maybe a second string defense um, or, or, and it is Kent state, but it'll be interesting to see how the two compare and, and how, what the offensives look like with the two quarterbacks in Zach, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I'm interested to see how the quarterback plays, but I think a big part of that's going to be how the offensive line plays. Uh, and that's going to be really what I'm going to have my eyes glued to because that's the biggest question mark coming into this season. You know, A&M had some real um, road pavers last year. A lot of guys went to the NFL. What are they going to do to replace those players? You know, are you going to have Bryce Foster playing at center, a true freshman going to be out there? You're going to have Deuce Fathery going to be another true freshman or or Matthew Wyckoff going to be out there and getting some meaningful reps at O-line? Um, and, and how is the pass protection going to be? Not to mention the run protection. Yeah, you've got these great running backs, and you've got a quarterback that can pull it down and run with it. But if they're not getting blocks, they're not going to get a lot of yards. And so uh, I, I am. I think I'm going to be the most interested in seeing how this offensive line does. Again, though, it's hard to tell because – not knocking Kent state, but you are going up against Kent state. I mean, they very well might have the best defensive line in their respective conference, but let's face it. The sec boasts the best defensive lines of anybody in the country. So we'll get a little taste of what the offensive line, what the O line is going to look like this year and how well it's going to be able to gel. And I think that's going to be the biggest hurdle to overcome. If you want to have a quarterback uh, in Haynes King, having a good year. We've talked about both those things a lot in our different podcasts and things leading up. I'm going to pull some obscure ones. First one, let's start off with, I'm excited to see the pomp and circumstance of college football back with the bands on the field, with uh, everything being a little bit more back to normal. That's what makes college football, college football. And so uh, I'm excited to see that too. As far as a, a, a nuance to that game, I am really excited about seeing uh, what AM's defensive secondary can do against 
what was the number one scoring offense in, in the country in Kent state. Um, and, and granted it was an all a uh, max schedule and, and there was a lot to be said about that, but they were able to, to throw the ball around a lot last year. And so it, I, I fully expect the defensive secondary to be good as they were last year, but it'll be an early challenge to get them uh, to see where they are in, in shaking the rust off and getting back in the season. And that should be pretty uh, exciting as well. Third, for the past two years, Seth Small has been the guy kicking, and I think he will be the guy kicking again. But we've started to see Caden Davis stepping in there when things need a little bit more distance. Uh, we did it saw it in the spring game. We saw it a couple times at practice. Interesting to see if we'll have maybe a little bit of rotation or what that looks like. Now, I don't necessarily expect AM to be kicking a whole bunch of field goals, maybe in, in garbage time. But um, as the season progresses, what does that uh, kicking situation look like for the Aggies? That's that's what I'm uh, looking out for the most in this game. Yeah, here's one other thing I'm looking for. You mentioned the pomp and circumstance and AM's doing the the whole red, white, and blue out mm. this weekend. You know, that'll be pretty neat to see, you know, honoring those that were we lost in 9-11. And um, you know, it sounds like they're they they've sold a lot of shirts and been able to coordinate a lot of that really well uh so far. So so that's something that I that I'm interested to see. You know, it, we're gonna have a pretty full stadium too. Uh, you know, Kyle Field was surprisingly loud last year, even with 25,000 people. But, uh, you know, uh, ho- hopefully people stay healthy and safe at the game. But, you know, it- it'll be nice to have more of a normal environment again. For sure. For sure. Were either of you at that game, the the September 11th game? Zach, you wouldn't have been down here by now. Uh, Alex, were you at that? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, the first Zal- game I remember going to, and it was like, I was like six or seven years old. So now nah, I was like three when that happened. So gotcha. okay. I do remember, I do remember my grandparents talking about it. And obviously uh, you see the pictures, lots of people have the, that framed or put on their Facebook pages or whatever. Um, so that's pretty neat, but yeah, I, I was not, uh, I was not down here as of yet. I still had a few years few years to go. Um, but my grandparents, I believe were at that ball game. Mm-hmm. One breakout player that you think this is going to have a year this year. Who's the breakout player going to be? Zach. I am going to say you'll Keith Brown, a uh, wide receiver, true freshman. Lots of people have been talking, kind of raving about him this fall camp. And I think he's going to be a pretty talented guy. If they can get him the ball, uh, and, and I think he'll still get some play, plenty of playing time as an offense, uh, or I should say as a true freshman on the offense. So, uh, yeah, you'll Keith Brown. Man, Zach, you stole mine. I, yeah, that's, I still that's, that's, that's who I was going to say. Well, you, um, you can blame Travis for that because he hey, went. You're welcome. To, to add to your point, I think you'll Keith will be a guy kind of like we saw with Anias his freshman year where maybe we don't see him a ton in some of the early games as he's still learning that offense, but in the back half of the season, see him implemented more, getting him the ball in certain situations. Here's a guy I'll go with, uh, Edron Cooper at linebacker. Mm. Uh, he's a guy that people have continuously raved about throughout the off season. You know, we've seen him running with the first team here and there. I feel like AM's got a pretty solid rotation at linebacker. When you look at Aaron Hansford, Andre white, and then Cooper, um, you know, Andre White, uh, he was he was kind of the he was kind of the go-to backup last year. Seems seemed to be the heir apparent to Buddy Johnson when after he graduated last season. But you know, everything that I've seen, Edron Cooper, man, he's challenging for that spot. And so I think he's a guy that he, he's gonna make some waves this fall on the defensive side. My guy, who we talked about a little bit in our post press conference video, Alex, you and I is uh, offensive lineman Aki Ugumbi. And I said it right because I have a pronunciation gap. Aki. <laughs> no. This, it's this Aki. Says, it's Aki. Well, well, if you look at this pronunciation guide, it says Aki. Okay, Aki. A-C-K-E-E. Okay. This is not Aki. a Tara Alaka because that really thinks Aki. Travis for a, for a loop. When a Tara Aki. Playing. Hey, thank you, Travis. Yeah. So... I think, I mean, he's a, he's a freshman. He's stepping in just like Kenyon green did last year. Um, and, and I know it, it's hard to 
put any uh, emphasis on necessarily what we see in the limited time and practice that we get to see players, but just about every day, he was the stalwart. He was the one guy that you guaranteed was going to be in the first teamers. Uh, and Jimbo Fisher raved about him in the summer talking circuit. So he's a guy that I think is going to be able to do some good stuff. And, and uh, I, I will be excited to see what he brings to the table. Also, uh, Luke Matthews, if he's, if he's healthy, when he steps up there, um, and just the continuation of that, that clan uh, and what they what he'll be able to bring to the table. So a few offensive linemen guys I'm looking forward to. Well, okay, I have I have one more question. All right. Okay. Who will be the first AM player to score a touchdown this season? Oh, now we're just getting into prop bets. Ooh. Yes. Let's let's do one more pro, let's do one prop bet for the game this week. Who will be the first AM player to score a touchdown? Zach, you get first pick again. So you can steal my pick probably. Isaiah Spiller. And that was going to be my pick. <laughs> you say right. I'll go random. You I'll go that. random. You say that no matter what. All right. Alex, well, well you, you pick yours. No, 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 no. I want to go last. You go to, you go. Travis. I'll go, I'll go a little bit out there and I'll say Caleb Chapman. Okay. That's what Alice was going to say. He was going to say that one too. Hey, how about this? Haynes King. There you go. There you go. We'll, that we'll, could be rushing or passing. Oh, uh, we'll, <laughs> that's cheating. That's Will. We'll come back to this next week and see. So, uh, and see how well we did. I believe last time I checked, and I'm trying to check a little bit again, the spread on the game is a lot to a little about. It's about 28.5, 29.5. Let's say 28.5. We don't need to do predictions, I don't think. We'll just do does Kent State cover? What was the spread again? Tell me one more time. 28.5. I say no. Uh, I say yes, but barely. I'm going to go ahead and say yes, but barely too, because that, that they, they do bring a pretty good offense in there. I think they'll be able to move the ball a little bit at times. If, um, and if anything, there might be a little bit of garbage time in there too. So if it got out of hand, uh, they probably would be going up against second, third string guys. So I do think they cover, but I don't think there's any way. Of course, AM is losing this one. A good little tune up for the Aggies. Well, we'll move on. So, next on the My Aggie Nation podcast, Alex, Robert Cessna, and I sat down with Alan Moff of the uh, Record Chronicle up there in Kent to break down a little bit about who AM's opponent will be. That's next on the My Aggie Nation podcast. And so we welcome uh, a, a, an opposing beat reporter for Kent State. That's uh, A&M's first opponent this year. And that is Alan Moff. Alan, if you would uh, let everyone know uh, uh, where your, your outlet is, how to find you, and and kind of your initial takes on the Kent State football team this year. Oh, uh, yeah. I work for the Record Courier newspaper right in Kent. Um, I have to look up my Twitter handle. I don't know right <laughs> off the top of my head. I'll get that for you. I appreciate you asking. Uh, I've covered Kent State for uh, in two stints for going on about 15, 16 years. And uh, I've seen a lot of bad football. Uh, it's been a <laughs> – program's had a rough run for a long time, but they're actually uh, on a nice uptick here, and they're pretty excited about this upcoming season. For sure, for sure. Well, we have to start with – uh, the offense. I think that's what kind of generates some of the, the attention, what's generated some of that little bit of an uptick. And of course, uh, uh, quarterback um, uh, Dustin Crum, uh, he returns this year. How much of the focus of the success is on this offense and the way that they're able to sling the ball around uh, like they were last year? I mean, uh, Dustin Crum was uh, up there in if not fourth in the nation in, in, in pass efficiency and uh uh, 85th in passing yards, but, but was a really effective quarterback last season. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he came on, he won the job, uh, almost won the job two years ago, coming out of camp, um, came in, came on in the first game and, uh, did really well. Rest is history. Um, <laughs> had a real good year two years ago, brought it right into last year. And, um, in the bowl game win against Utah state in 2019, really came on, had a huge game. Uh, Gordon going against Jordan Love at Utah State, who's now at the Packers, and kind of just, you know, played as well, if not better than him. Um, so, 
no longer a, a guy that uh, nobody knows about. He's really caught, caught a lot of attention nationally. Um, you know, the pro scouts are around and, uh, you know, he's a, uh, he's a guy that has uh, he can kind of do it all. He's got a, you know, he's not a tremendously athletic guy that's really going to blow you away with athleticism, but he just seems to be able to move around well. Um, in the pocket, he can, he gains yards. He's got these long strides. that just seems to, you know, just kind of next thing, you know, he's 10 yards downfield, um, you know, very accurate downfield passer. And, uh, obviously just a really smart kid that knows how to run a, a pretty, a pretty, a, a high tempo offense and a, you know, pretty elaborate offense that they run, um, under, under Sean Lewis here. He's an old Syracuse, uh, offensive coordinator. They like to, uh, they like to run a lot of plays as quickly as they possibly can and, and get your defense on your heels and cause substitution and, and, and energy issues and that type of thing. What about how do they feel that's going to work against such, you know, AM's returning so many defensive players, even if they're missing a couple because of what have you off the field incidents. There's always a fear of running a quick offense, three and out. Suddenly your defense is back out there again. What about the quality when you look at the level of competition, you know, that offense against a ms defense? Well, I'll say this. They will try to do what they do. Um, whether they're going to be successful at it or not, uh, definitely <laughs> remains to be seen. Uh, this is an, uh, obviously a huge challenge for Kent State. I think Kent State's going to do really well in their league. Um, they're obviously stepping out of their league here in, in a major, major way. Um, but I, the one thing I've learned about Sean, you know, in, in past – in past years, Kent State teams have played teams similar to Texas a and very highly regarded teams, and they've kind of gone into a shell and just tried to survive the games. He will not do that. They will come down there to play. They will try to do what they do. Um, and, and, again, whether they'll be successful at it, very questionable, <laughs> obviously, but they'll try. They'll try to go up tempo. If they get some three and outs, they'll put their defense on that field and and, and see what happens. <laughs> but they'll try. I mean I'll be interested because Jimbo talked yesterday about a lot about the transfers, about how many D1 players transferred in. So I was wondering, you know, a, a, a mid, you know, a mid-major like that, you know, and I've been up, I've lived in Pennsylvania, so I know there's good high school football up there, but it's here to get Division One talent that maybe didn't make it somewhere. Uh, why such an influx of uh, D1 transfers, or, be, or is it because of the portal? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the portal is obviously, you well know, it's kind of set everything on its ear. But um, I think the main thing that's happening right now with Kent State is uh, you're talking, uh, again, like I, like I said, they've been down for a long time. All of a sudden, they've got this young, vibrant head coach. Uh, their coaching staff's a bunch of young guys that really know how to, you know, to, to communicate with today's kids. And uh, it, it's a really, there's a lot of exciting things going on there right now. Um, you got so many guys out there looking for new homes. And they're all of a sudden become a destination because they're a proving ground, like you said, for these these guys that maybe were marginal where they were before things didn't work out. Now, all of a sudden, you can come to a Kent State. Um, you can play right away, hopefully, or you'll have that opportunity. And, and they have a chance to be really good this year in, in their league and, and at their level. But uh, And then also, obviously, you got you know three games like Texas A&M. They're also going to play two Big Ten teams. So um, as far as proving grounds go, a lot of these guys are ex-Big Ten players. So they want to go back there and, and – you know, they've got things to prove themselves. So uh, the opportunity is there for these guys. And a lot of them have, uh, a lot of them have jumped aboard. You know, you Alan, oh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, Alan, I was just going to say, you know, you mentioned there's been a, there's been a long slew of bad seasons for Kent state and, you know, they're projected to win the Mac this year. I see Kent state's only won one conference championship in its history. And, you know, you mentioned the, the big games against Iowa and Maryland coming up, you know, what what exactly is the excitement level for Kent State looking down the road for conference play and how valuable are these games early on going to be for them uh, getting some experience against some better teams? Well, again, they, they've – Sean has treated these games a lot differently than they have in the past, as I said. Um, he goes to win them um, without any questions. They're not going to hold anybody back or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, if you're Kent State, boy, you know, you're, you're trying to survive these games. It's a simple fact. I mean, you, you want to go out there, you want to play well. Obviously, you want to be in a game in the fourth quarter somehow at Texas A&M. But, you know, if you're not, you move on real quick, obviously, and you hope that you survive and you hope you're still healthy. Um, you know, the main thing is to get out through all these games. Um, you know, once again this year, they're going to make more money from playing these three non-conference games against, um, you know, high-powered fives. 
uh, than anybody else in the nation. And then especially after last year, as everyone knows, with the budget issues, they need to do it this year more than ever. So um, you, you hope you can compete. Your main thing you hope is you stay healthy. And, and, you know, like I said, once they get into the max season, if they've still got all their guns, they should have a really good year. You mentioned uh, to beforehand all the, the 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 bad football seasons you've watched leading up to this little bit of a resurgence in in kind of the Reader's Digest version. What is the um, what is that progression from from seasons uh, low seasons up into the high that they have here uh, building the program that they've had? Um, you know, Sean's done a real nice job of getting this turned around relatively quickly. And this is only his fourth year. Um, you know, they went two and 10 the first year. And, and other than running some faster offense and scoring some more points, things look a lot, sim- you know, a lot of similar things as in the past, um, you know, as far as not being able to win close games and then, and then things just kind of falling apart here and there, but uh, they got on a roll um, late midway through 2019. Um, they won a game against Buffalo. They scored just three touchdowns in the last seven minutes and just everything happened. Perfect. Um, and, and they won a game. They probably shouldn't have. And it got them going. And the next thing you know, um, you know, like I said, they've, they, they've always had an offense that was intriguing. Um, you know, Crum emerges as a quarterback that can really run it, can do a lot of things. And then all of a sudden you get some guys around them. Um, you know, they've got more weapons this year uh, than I've ever seen without a question. I mean, they had a, they had an 11 win team in 2012 um, that made it to the MAC championship game. And obviously it was a really good team. Um, and this team has more weapons without a question. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of positive things. It, it's, it's building. Um, and, and, you know, the excitement level at Kent State is about as high as it gets at Kent State. I mean, we're not talking about the college station where there's going to be hundred and some odd thousand people, but uh, the community, there's a buzz here that has not been here in a long time. That's for sure. So coach talked about what about weather? I mean, they, they, get, they get a break at a seven o'clock game because I guess it'll still be in the low 90s. Hard to tell what the humidity will be, but a lot of teams come down here from, you know, whether it's the West Coast or the East, you know, Central. And it's I mean, uh, in the weather kick off at four or three or something like that. Has, has the coach talked anything about the weather conditions and just being on the road at A&M? Oh, he's talked about that without a question. And I tell you what, they had a really mild weather, cool camp until last week. Last week, it finally uh, heated up a little bit, but they were actually, they broke camp Thursday. So they probably were only in it a couple of days. So, I mean, oh yeah, that's a concern without a question. I know they're going to try to funnel as many kids in there as they possibly can to try to keep people as fresh as they possibly can. And, And fortunately for Kent State, again, at their level, their depth is far, far uh, greater than it's been in a long time. So um, they're not going to be shoving a lot of true freshmen in there like they normally would be. Um, they're actually got some guys that they can plug in that have some experience and, and, and hopefully can hold their own. What about the kicking game? I, Jimbo, we kind of laughed yesterday. He talked about a 52 yard field goal and a scrimmage. So I don't know where Jimbo saw uh, scrimmage tape on, uh, on uh, Kent state, but he definitely, do Kent State better than uh, any Reader's Digest? I don't know if you saw the t- tape yesterday. He he raved at them for about uh, about three minutes. So I, I just wonder. A lot of times, uh, co- co- schools like that can't have a good kicking game. What what's the quick kicking game? Do you feel coming in here for the for Kent State? Major major concern. Um, they actually had a kicker who was the MAC Player of the Year two years ago who transferred grad transferred to Minnesota. Um, and then two years ago, they had a punter that was among the best, if not the best in the Mac and he grad transferred to Northwestern. So they have, they will have a true freshman kicker and a true freshman punter. And he is, uh, Sean is not one of those coaches. And there aren't really many of them out there anymore that don't, uh, put a lot of emphasis on special teams, but he certainly does. And he's extremely concerned about that. No question, especially going into this game and the athletes that they're going to face and, and how quick things are going to happen. Um, he did refer to a 52 yarder that the, that the kicker did. Uh, they had, it's kind of funny. They had an intra squad scrimmage a couple of Fridays ago and Sean uh, had a bunch of different kids in different numbers and a bunch of kids in jerseys that you know, couldn't even read them. And I asked him about it after the game. He's like, well, yeah, you know why I did that. He says, the A&M's probably got 30 guys that are going to be analyzing this tape. So I had to do something about that. So um, that's funny that you mentioned that tape. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, you know, probably you, you can't tell, but I would assume with all those transfers coming in, 
once again, getting back, you know, AM hopes to have a pretty good return game, particularly with, with their punt returner. But I would guess this influx of talent would make uh, Kent State's special teams, particularly the coverage units, a little bit better. Yeah, he's already mentioned using several of those guys um, in the return games and the coverage units especially. So, yeah, I mean, no question. Um, but, again, their, their punter is an Australian kid, um, so they're going to mm. do some rugby-style punting, I'm assuming, and try to, you know, do those types of things, which – when they work, they're fine. Uh, something comes off the foot and you're already heading to the left and you kick it to the left. You got a major problem. So, I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> there's some scary things that could happen there. I know they're very concerned. Um, we'll see what happens. One more going back to the offense. I know you look at, it's the number one scoring offense in the country last year, but also fourth in the country in interceptions and fourth in turnovers lost. How much of last year was high risk, high reward. And and how much is that going to be the key to making the next step forward for them this season? Well, I mean, you have to take the, you know, that's a, it's a really cool thing for Kent state to lead the nation in anything, obviously, Um, you know, before Sean took over their offense was, I mean, last in the nation or or next to last for three, four straight years. So um, unreal what they've done, how far they've come. But at the same time, three of the teams they played last year, they're all Mac games, three of the teams, I believe two of them didn't win a game and the, the other maybe won one. They played one quality opponent, and that was Buffalo, and, and, and Buffalo's running back ran for 400 and some odd yards on them, and they lost pretty heavily. So um, those stats are cool. I mean, their offense is obviously very dangerous, but, you know, they didn't play any A&Ms last year, obviously, and they didn't play any non-conference games at all. So, you know, to say that they're going to put those numbers on, it's not going to happen, obviously. Mm-hmm. But uh, they do have – some weapons um, without a question that would that would grab anybody's attention. I'm sure Jimbo can see some things on there that t- to sell his kids to be concerned about. <laughs> so, um, and those are always a good thing if you're a head coach to get their attention. Um, and they will make some plays. I do feel confident that they will make some plays. I don't know how many, but they will, you know, they'll, they'll be there. They'll show up and they're not going to just, uh, you know, just kind of just get rolled over like they you know, don't even belong in the field. I mean, there probably be times of that, but I don't think in general, I think they will make some impact plays. You know, sometimes we uh, try to look way too deep into the tea leaves. But uh, you tell me, Alan, are we probably looking at if Dustin can have a, you know, if Crum can have a good game, the offensive line can hold up. Is, is that going to be the key for Kent State being competitive, the quarterback and, and those five linemen? Yeah, offensively, no question. And, and then they have a lot of experience up front. But again, that's experience at a level of, uh, that, you can assert yourself at your level is one thing. Handling guys at AM is going to throw at them is a whole different thing. Um, they're going to have to run the ball a little bit. They've got some good running backs, um, but they've got to try to get, you know, these guys off the quarterback. Um, and they obviously don't want Crum running a whole lot because that's just disaster waiting to happen. So um, there's no question that the trenches on both sides, uh, you know, I think that's a concern. The biggest concern to me is, uh, you know, defensively trying to match up with your offensive linemen who are just absolutely huge. Um, Kent State is very undersized. They don't really try to be big. They try to be more um, getting long athletic kids that can they can show you a different lot, a lot of different looks, line them up in different spots, try to fool you and trick you in those ways. Um, but what teams have had a lot of success doing is just basically being physical and pounding them. And uh, boy, Texas A&M obviously has every tool in the world to do exactly that if they choose, if they so choose. <laughs> I'm interested when you go out to lunch or go out to church or whatever, you know, you're play, they're opening with the sixth ranked team in the country. What about the, is there a buzz back there? As you mentioned last year with the COVID or whatever, what about just outside the program looking in, how do they view this game? Um, You know, like I said, they've played so many, like some teams in Kent state shoes. This is like a, a once in a lifetime thing or something like that. They played, they played Alabama when they were number one or coming off of national championships. Um, they played Ohio state. They've played teams similar repeatedly in the recent past, especially. So um, I think everybody's interested to see how they'll do, whether they'll, you know, what they'll be able to do. Um, I don't think anybody's got any unrealistic expectations or anything like that. Um, But I do think that, you know, as far as playing a team of this caliber, they've never been more suited to, to show up and try to do some things. So it's a lot more exciting than normal. I think you're, it's, in the past, it's just like survive, survive, survive. And now you're sitting there thinking, okay, they might be able to do a few things here. So that's what I think that's the general thoughts going in. Alex, you got anything left? I think we've covered it all. 
Great. Well, I'm going to close out. Yeah. I'll close out with this one for people who don't maybe know a whole lot about the Kent State football program, the school in general. What's, in your opinion, the the, the best tradition, the best uh, game day experience? Uh, what, what's kind of the hallmark of of Kent State or, or being a part of uh, in that that fandom uh, with the football program? You know, that's stuff that Sean's building right now, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it's hard to build those types of things when you've been as bad as they've been for so long. Um, but you know, they've got the band more involved. Um, they're going out in the community and getting the community more involved. Um, and the community actually cares now because they're worth watching. So those things are all kind of honestly, just they're budding right now. They've got a new athletic director. They've got a lot of plans. They're trying to build off of this football team as much as they can. Um, and try to try to get some of those things set up more than anything that they've really got established at this point, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Cease, what was your final thought? I was going to say, Alan did a better job in snobs in that team than uh, Jim. So, Alan, you can do that. that's That's pretty good, man. Well, I, anytime I can say, I, say I'm better than him, I'll take it, man. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, Alan, thanks so much uh, for, for giving us a few minutes of your time. Uh, be sure to uh, give him a few clicks, few reads as you get geared up for this AM and Kent State game. And uh, we'll be back with more coverage uh, leading up to the game. Uh, for Robert Cessna, Alex Miller, I'm Travis Brown. Thanks so much. It seems like every day, everything just has a way, a way to must have the seems. But if we don't watch what we're doing, our hearts will get ruined by silly things. Good love ain't needs a girl, we know that's true. If we want to keep it, we got to watch everything that we do, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Don't want to make sure, my baby, make sure you're sticking with me. Don't want to make sure that we'll be all that we can be, all that we can